Religion has profoundly influenced the sweeping American narrative, perhaps more than any other force in our history, from the time before European colonization to the present. The startup National Museum of American Religion is working to build a museum in the nation's capital that will share the story of what religion has done to America and what America has done to religion, inviting all to explore the role of religion in shaping the social, political, economic, and cultural lives of Americans and thus America itself. Join our host, Chris Stevenson, for season two of our podcast series, Religion in the American Experience, as we follow scholars deep into America's religious history and learn how it can inform and animate us as citizens grappling with complex questions of governance and American purpose in the 21st century. Episodes will be released every Monday on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Register for notifications on our website, www.storyofamericanreligion.org, under the sign-up tab. Welcome to Religion in the American Experience, a podcast series of the Digital First National Museum of American Religion. It has been noted that religion was prominent at President Joe Biden's inauguration, as it often is at presidential inaugurations, in traditional ways. The oath of office was taken with the president's hand on the family Bible. The invocation was offered by a Catholic priest, the benediction by an African Methodist Episcopal Church pastor, musical numbers with threads of religion in them, including Amazing Grace, were performed, and Old Testament scripture and God were invoked by President Biden in his address. Yet, religious tests for public office are banned by the Constitution, America may have no state church, and we are very sensitive to the intertwining of government and religion. Adding to that mix, the Pew Research Center reported a few years ago that the U.S. is steadily becoming less Christian and less religiously observant, and there is now a fully developed idea in the public square that religion is part of, not a solution to, America's problems. American civil religion, in quotations, the idea that a non-sectarian, quasi-religious faith exists within the U.S. with sacred symbols drawn from national history may be helpful to us at our present moment in American history. We can use it as a lens to view the recent inauguration and our current politics generally as we participate in the American experiment in self-government founded 245 years ago saved 156 years ago, and work to see it successfully extended into the future for ourselves and our children. What are we to think of American civil religion? What is it? What is its history? What does it mean? How does it motivate us? What are the ramifications? Is it on the upswing or is it fading? What has it done to us? What does it do to us? And how does it drive our behavior, political or otherwise? Today's panel consists of four distinguished scholars who will help us with these questions. First, Dr. Nicole F. R. Phillips is Associate Professor in the Practice of Sociology of Religion and Culture, Director of the Black Church Studies Program at Emory University, and author of Patriotism, Black and White, The Color of American Exceptionalism. Nicole, give us a, a wave so we know who you are. Thank you for having me. Dr. Philip Gorski is professor of sociology at Yale University and author of American Covenant, A History of Civil Religion from the Puritans to the Present. Phil, give us a wave. Good to be with you all. Dr. John Carlson is professor of religious studies at Arizona State University, where he directs the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict. He is co-editor of From Jeremiah to Jihad, Religion, Violence, and America. And finally, Dr. Lisa Barnett, thank you, John, is Assistant Professor of American Religious History at Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Thank you each be for being with us today. The Startup Digital First National Museum of American Religion is both a place of convening for discussions about current national issues where religion or the idea of religious freedom are in play, as we are doing today, and the nationally recognized center for presenting, interpreting, and educating the public about what religion has done to America and what America has done to religion. 
including the history of the revolutionary and indispensable idea of religious freedom as a governing principle in the United States. Join us in supporting the National Museum of American Religion by donating at storyofamericanreligion.org forward slash contribute, where for a donation of $200 or more, you will receive a free gift. Panelists, again, thank you very much uh, and for your patience during that long introduction. Phil, let's begin with you. Can you give our listeners a definition of American civil religion? Sure. American civil religion is a certain story about the United States, how it came to be, and where it needs to go. The contemporary version of American civil religion is most familiar to contemporary Americans through the rhetoric of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. um, and revived through the rhetoric of Barack Obama, namely that America's project is to be a nation of nations, uh, a people of peoples that is supposed to aspire to be a multiracial democracy um, that uh, affords equality and justice to all. And I think it's important at the very outset to say that this is not the only such story in American Covenant. I distinguish it from two others. One is the story of white Christian nationalism, which says that the United States was founded as a Christian nation by uh, white Christian men, that it is founded in some sense directly on biblical uh, principles, perhaps even directly inspired by God, that its prosperity and power are the result of uh, divine blessings, a special exceptional status that it has in the eyes of God, and that the presence of non-whites, non-Christians, non-Americans on sacred American soil threatens the removal of all of those blessings. There's also another narrative, which I call um, radical secularism, which says America is a secular republic based on a godless constitution that's founded on the principle of separation of church and state, and that any intrusion of religion or religious people in the public sphere of public discourse threatens to uh, poison uh, American democracy. So those are the three competing narratives that I identify in my book and civil religion is in some ways, I think the the via media, the path between the other two extremes. Thank you, Phil. Um, This can be an open conversation at this point, but uh, I wanna hear especially uh, from Nicole and Lisa uh, about uh, your voice, your voices that that you have studied uh, regarding the American civil religion. Either of you can, can speak up. Um, I'll I'll just jump in here Um, uh, uh, based on what Phil said. I actually studied American civil religion uh, based also on his works, Um, but the uh, originator or the person who coined the uh, concept of an American civil religion was uh, Robert Bella. And so so many sociologists have written about American civil religion as well as um, uh, historians, and uh, I enter it, I enter this concept of an American civil religion uh, from the perspective of um, a more prophetic form of American civil religion. And so there, there are two forms. Um, there's a priestly form and a prophetic form, or there may be many different forms, but when we talk about an American civil religion, there is a priestly uh a priestly tradition and a prophetic tradition. And the priestly tradition is more conciliatory in terms of um, critiquing America and, and celebrating individual responsibility and an investment in a market economy and a liberal democracy. And then you have the prophetic form, which is um, it, it emerges as a place of cultural contestation. Um, and, 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 I, and I would suggest more strident uh, critique of where um, America has fallen short. And so uh, in, in, the, in the ways in which Phil has laid out 
uh, civil religion being uh, this kind of social canopy of diversity, uh, I enter I enter from the perspective of it is a social canopy canopy, but but, um, and that's where we have this. Um, idea of uh, diversity. And so uh, I look at it from the perspective of uh, regionalized forms of civil religion, as well as racialized forms of civil religion, because um, civil religion uh, in and of itself cannot necessarily hold the failures of um, of, uh, of American democracy. And so, for instance, um, in my studies, and, uh, and that was based my studies uh, are the basis for the book, Patriotism, Black and White, The Color of American Exceptionalism. I witnessed, I lived with, um, lived in uh, a community um, in the South uh, that practiced a Southern civil religion. Uh, and the, the, the difference or the distinction between a Southern civil religion and an American civil religion is that the American civil religion comes uh, out of an enlightenment tradition, but Southern civil religion um, is, is um, undergirded by evangelical faith. And so in the community in which I lived, there was no dissonance between inserting your religion into your political sphere and your politics into your religious sphere. And so there were on, on, on holidays like Memorial Day, July 4th, um, Veterans Day, Martin Luther King Day, uh, there were worship services that were centered around those themes. And, and as well, and I call my, I name my community Bald Eagles because at the time um, I did not ask for permission to release the name of the community. So, so people can take bald eagles and go, and, and, <laughs> and, and even though it's a pun, I, I hope that we understand uh, why I named the community bald eagles. Um, and so, so this Southern civil religion was based on God, nation, and family. Um, but it still is distinct from the other two streams that uh, Phil talked about. Um, and so civil religion is also understood as ritualistic um, uh, pra practices of patriotism. Uh, and so, yes, people were patriotic. They served their country. They understood that as being uh, American and what it meant to be American. Um, but then you have the racialized version, the, the black version and the uh, black version of civil religion always is um, in some respects connected to a Jeremiah uh, tradition. So where America has fallen short with respect to um, black people and other peoples um, of color and and always um, and calling calling America back um, as a corrective to 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 correct itself so that we can move forward as a nation. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. And I, I would like to jump in as well. I think Nicole has a really good point that there really isn't one civil religion that transcends all boundaries of identity markers and offers kind of one vision of a shared American history and a shared American experience. It's a very complex intersection of religion and a presumption of somehow a national shared identity around these prescribed cultural values and expectations that kind of unite us. But it really is more of a reconstruction of a nation's history that relies on myths and rituals and symbols to help create kind of this commemorative cultural memory that displays at least to the collective this ideal representation of who we are, but it's built around these policies of uh, that value settler colonialism uh, that still encroach upon religious practices. And I would say from particularly the, the Native American perspective, even the phrase civil religion calls up the twin prongs of civilization and Christianization to meet the, quote, Indian problem of the 19th century and to ship people off to boarding schools and erase then the culture uh, to meet those twin goals. Thank you for that, uh, Lisa. Appreciate that. John, anything uh, 
here at the beginning, at the outset, you want to say about um, American civil religion before we move on? Well, well let me start with a, a caveat, which is that uh, civil religion is a scholarly term, and um, it carries a lot of baggage. I would, if civil religion was a suitcase and you put it on an airplane, it couldn't get off, that plane could not get off the ground. That's how much baggage the term civil religion has. And so I think it's important in a conversation where you've got both academics think discussing a kind of um, set of ideas that are uh, engaged within the academy, uh, as well as a general audience for whom civil religion is not necessarily the kind of most intuitive idea. What, what is that? I mean, a lot of people are kind of allergic to the term religion. Um, it's important to think about, well, what is it? Or what are the other ways that you could describe it? So I would say sort of, let me just mention very briefly four, four things. One, it's some, the, the term religion comes from, you know, the Latin word religare, right? This is to bind, right? So it's, it's, it's that which binds us. So part of what civil religion is, is that which is presumptively there to unite us. We have this idea of e pluribus unum, right? Out of one, many. This, some civil religion is part of that um, feature of the unity that we are called to, to be in that unum. And so that's what Joseph Biden was speaking to at his inauguration, in which unity was that central theme. I would say that another part of it has to do with a faith in democracy, democratic faith. If you don't like the word religion, think of it as a civic creed or a democratic faith. And I say faith because right now we see a lot of evidence of democracy being under strain. A lot of people who are lacking in faith in democracy. We see massive efforts to restrict voting, for example, right? That represents not an effort to put more power in the people, bring more people to voting uh, and to, to, uh, to the pro project of democracy, but to restrict that. That's to me a sign of a of weak faith in democracy. I would also say that in some cases, there are plenty of reasons why people, if you look at the experiences and the histories that Nicole has written about, why people shouldn't have faith in democracy. There have been people who have been disenfranchised in the same thing that, that the same stories that Lisa's written about. People have been uh, disenfranchised for much of their life, and yet many people, in spite of those experiences, still have faith and believe in democracy, even if their experiences might tell them otherwise. I think that's something more than just um, uh, more more than just a, a kind of basic tenet or or assumption. That's, it really does require a kind of belief. Um, Thirdly, I would say that there's an ethical dimension to civil 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 religion. Uh, I've, I've sometimes called civil religion the moral backbone of the body politic. It's an idea that there are certain principles that guide us in our project of self-government and that sometimes we can be wrong. At the very least, we don't necessarily simply get to decide what the basis of right and wrong is. That was Lincoln's message, at least, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the second inaugural. Um, and finally, I would say that in some cases, there's a theological component to it as well, or certainly an intellectual component, an effort to try to really understand what the American experience represents uh, in light of some kind of higher truths, or at least some kind of uh, transcendent uh, moral order that, again, is not simply of our own creation, but has some kind of element of purpose uh, and plan, providential even, uh, that we are uh, in uh, an ongoing effort to understand uh, and, and work through. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So I think we've laid a good foundation uh, to move on towards the inauguration. That'll be our last question. What did we see there? What does it mean to us today? But let's go back and let's, let's, ask, let's discuss what American civil religion has done to us, has done to Americans, has done to America over, over our uh, uh, our history. Uh, Nicole, why don't you start? Nicole, what, what has it meant? What has it done to Americans? Bring us up, you know, talk a little bit about history and, and bring us up to, to current day a little bit. And anybody can jump in. So um, to answer your question, I'm going to start with, um, of course, I'm, I'm advocating for um, and naming a black civil religion 
tradition. The reality is, and I've been challenged on this, so I bring it up. Um, I've been challenged on, uh, is there such a thing as, and can you have regionalized forms and racialized forms of civil religion? Does that, does that really exist? Can that really exist if, if civil religion is supposed to be um, something that unifies and sacralizes um, the country. Uh, so I do, I want to put that out there. Um, so exactly what John said, this is a complex term. Um, and, and we as scholars, um, as well as uh, those who might believe in the term, get pushback. Uh, so what has it done for Black Americans? Uh, historians Charles Manis and um, Leonard Sweet both note racialized and regionalized versions of this American civil religion. And then later on, uh, a historian named David Howard Pitney conducted a 1995 study uh, of the Af African-American Jeremiah tradition. His study confirmed what historians before him stated that a racialized form of civil religion, a black civil religion springs up uh, alongside a white civil religious tradition. But this black civil religious tradition um, had roots had roots in um, the American Jeremiah, it had roots in um, black nationalism and a black nationalism that was meant to socially redeem America. The pro this progenitor form of black civil religion had it uh, 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 propagated the exodus motif. And so it was embraced by those who were enslaved. It was embraced by abolitionists. It was embraced by a Martin Luther King, those who were part of the civil rights uh, generation. And I would bring it up even to today and say that um, even though many um, Black Lives Matter activists might not look at the work that they're doing as civil religious, um, for those who understand their work as uh, participating in um, an American democratic project, um, it is embraced by them too. And, and an example of that, and the most, most recent and most prominent example of that is a Colin Kaepernick who um, speaks with a serviceman in initially when he was uh, protesting um, racial injustice and the brutalization of, of black bodies by the police um, or state violence against black bodies, um, he didn't initially kneel, but in conversation with a white serviceman, um, the, the serviceman essentially said to him, uh, you kneel to indicate that a man is down. So like in football, the kneeling is to indicate a man is down. So a, a, a subpopulation of society is down. And so his, his kneeling became civil religious because of when he did it. At the point of time um, that he kneeled, which was during the national anthem, right? And so that was a civil religious um, act. He didn't start, um, this, the, the Black Lives Matter movement started with a hashtag and, and three Black women, but it was popularized because he's a millennial and because of his civil religious um, action. And so I would say that um, what it has done for Americans generally and um, Black Americans uh, is, is that it has uh, become not just a form of uh, a protest, um, but it, it, it has become a type of articulation of an, what an ideal America would look like and where America um, needs to um, become better, strengthened, um, um, stronger um, towards Blacks, Indigenous peoples, and other peoples of color. So 
it's salient to articulating um, the, the democratic ideals and commitments to um, all populations in America, not just a particular population in America. Thank you, Nicole. Others, uh, jump in with your thoughts of what this American civil religion has done to us or for us. If I could echo uh, Nicole's comments there, I think uh, one of the things that I think and talk with people about when they're when they express skepticism about civil religion, which is understandable, uh, and we, we have to think about it critically, and we can talk about some of the the reasons why there's there's a, a fair bit of skepticism about it. But before I, what I what I say in response is before you take that off the table, think about what you're pulling away, because the discourses and traditions of civil religion are not only long and enduring and form part of the heritage of the country, but they've been essential principles that minorities in our country have always drawn upon to demonstrate that they are fully American too. And when you pull that away, you pull that back, what are you left with? What are they left with? What resources are you giving marginalized people to be able to then say, we're fully American too, look at us. One of the things I think is nice about um, uh, Phil, Phil's book on American Covenant is it lays out these um, this development, this ongoing unfolding of a kind of canon of civil religion, where it's not just the old white Protestant Puritan founder, John Winthrop, and those who look or sound like him, but it's also a Catholic priest, John Courtney Murray. It's also a Jewish political philosopher for Hannah Arendt. Uh, it's also, you know, black thinkers like and, and activists like Martin Luther King who embrace that. And, and it's, Oftentimes using the prophetic language, that's really, really critical. The black Jeremiah is, uh, has been a, has been a, a vital, vitally important part of the, of the American tradition. Um, you know, Nicole mentioned the Exodus politics. That Exodus politics goes back to the revolution when uh, the motto was, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, resistance to, re you know, rebellion against tyrants is obedience to God. Right. And they actually had, you know, Moses, this icon of Moses leading the Israelites <laughs> uh, through uh, to the promised land with Pharaoh behind them. Pharaoh, of course, at that time rep being represented by the by the English crown. Uh, so the Exodus politics is goes back a long, long ways. And of course, it's been used in the uh, against that in the fight for abolition and against slavery in the civil rights movement. You know, King famously saying, I may not get there. Uh, with you when he looks over, but I have seen the promised land, right? So this is this is just really crucial to our uh, to our, to our own tradition and uh, and our heritage. And I, I think we have to recognize that important part of the prophetic piece. Let me say something very briefly, though, in support of the of the um, the priestly dimension of civil religion. Uh, we can sometimes um, focus more on one and on than on the other. I think that priestly dimension is still very important. Nothing was more important for legitimizing the first black president of our country than the priestly tradition that he embodied when he took the oath, when he gave a stirring inaugural address, when he fell in line with this long tradition of uh, that had gone before him and, and then added to it. So I think that's a really, really important one. We don't have to choose between those priestly and prophetic uh, dimensions. There's a time for both. Thanks, John. Lisa, I, I'm interested to hear from you. Uh, what has the uh, what has American civil religion done to uh, and for Native American populations? Yeah, it's very interesting because, um, again, it is kind of that complex sort of intersection when we look at issues around Americanness uh, and citizenship. I mean, one of the last groups to actually get citizenship in this country and status were Native Americans, 1924 with the Wheeler Act, right? 
Um, although others were able to uh, piecemeal some citizenship status together in terms of patriotic service, going off to World War I and fighting for the flag that you are really not a citizen of, at least acknowledged by a federal government in that nationalistic sort of form there. And I think that's where then this kind of creation of Americanness and American identity, while it can provide some basis for unity, it can also sometimes, I think, create a false sense of unity around some of those symbols, particularly rooted in white supremacist systems that are still operating in our country. Um, you know, you talk about the Exodus politics. Uh, one of the articles I assign, it's an older article now, and one of our, our Hebrew Bible professor assigns Robert Warrior's article, uh, Cowboys and Canaanites, right? Where the Native Americans are considered the Canaanites, right? Going to the promised land meant that someone else got kicked out of the promised land. And here in what becomes the United States of America, that would be the dispossession of land uh, by Native Americans. You know, I think to even the inauguration, all inaugurations, you put your hand right on a sacred written text that elevates the idea of the written printed word over indigenous oral cultures and the traditions there, right? And so already this idea of what constitutes American means, well, you speak English or you read, and this idea then of the printed word uh, that elevates civilization um, and then you combine that certainly with the Bible and scripture and you get the Christianization aspect of that as well. So it's it's messages like that, subtle messages that are sent through some of those rituals and some of those symbols uh, without further discussion and explanation that I think we have to be careful of. It, uh, is there a possibility of the Native American population uh, in some way embracing their own American civil religion, much like Nicole talked about, that, that the blacks uh, in the country, the African Americans, have created a black uh, American civil religion? Is there a similar thing that's possible there or has already happened? Yeah, I think certainly it started with the red power of, of you know, movement in the 1960s and the 1970s. It continues today, certainly, with the protection of water issues, uh, Standing Rock and Oak Flats and, and, and land issues. This, you know, what a lot of people don't understand is that the sacredness of particular lands to particular tribes is so very important to the preservation of a religiosity that is tied and rooted in the land. And until people kind of get that and honor and respect that. Um, and then I think there's just differences in how we view the use of land. That Native Americans, it's much more kind of the interdependency and the stewardship, the caretakers of the earth, not necessarily the developers of it, uh, and the respect for all of the beings within that creation uh, that needs to be there, that until we have some sort of reciprocal recognition, then we can't share even that same sort of religious experience in, a, in an American free market capitalist system. Okay, thank you. Uh, Phil, the expert, the man who wrote the book, anything on what uh, American civil religion has done to us before we move on? Well, let me just pick up on a couple of themes that have been brought up by the, the other panelists, uh, all very important um, points that, that they've been made, that they've made. So I, I think um, Nicole is, is quite right to emphasize uh, the, the role that uh, African-American theologians, intellectuals, scholars, activists, movements have played um, in um, developing and expanding uh, the, the the civil religious tradition, I, you know, as I emphasized, I think in my opening remarks that you know the version that I think that um, exists today really um, arises um, out of this out of the civil rights movement um, during the the second civil rights movement, uh, you know, during during the 1950s and this uh, prophetic interpretation. So uh, I think I would go even further to say that as uh, the ranks of 
white liberal Protestantism have declined, this has made the, the role of a black progressive Christians in the uh, civil religious tradition even more important than than it was than it was was previously. Um, John John I think rightly raises the the issue of what is what is the alternative? Careful careful what you what you wish for. I think there are uh, to put it in a very pointed way. I think there are um, many. Uh, secular progressives who imagine that the alternative to civil religion is secular progressivism, but it may in fact be uh, some kind of uh, proto-fascist political religion, such as I think we see emerging in some quarters um, of the Republican Party as we speak right now, as you see closer ties uh, between white supremacist groups and uh, Republican leaders, for example, at this past weekend. CPAC um, meeting. So uh, I think the lesson there is, is, is careful what you, what you wish for. Um, but I think that, um, or it's also right to, to highlight uh, how that American civil religion has always been a kind of a close kin or fraternal twin, if you like, of, of white, white Christian nationalism. Um, and, uh, you know, indeed this cowboys and Canaanites thing that mm -hmm. really, you know, before there were cowboys and Canaanites, there were Puritans and Canaanites. So mm -hmm. this is, you know, Cotton Mather is one of the people who really most clearly articulates this idea of the native peoples as being Canaanites or Amalekites. Right. Um, you know, there was a certain puzzlement initially amongst the Puritans about how to understand the native peoples. Were they the lost tribes of Israel? Were they people to be uh, converted? Um, well, um, one, one way of interpreting it was in this exterminationist way. And I, I do think that one of the things that is um, redeeming potentially about uh, this kind of prophetic version of American civil religion is that there is a self-awareness of sin and the original sin uh, in the American project um, and, you know, a desire somehow to, to make things right. And that part of what that does mean is it means uh, sort of openness dialogue uh, and, and, uh, and inclusion and opening the possibility of a, again, of a nation of nations and, and a people, people of peoples. Thank you, Phil. Quick question before we move on to the last one as far as, and the last one's going to deal with our present moment and, and where American civil religion fits in, where it should fit in, where it did fit in recently. The, the increase in secularism in the United States, does that, and, and maybe the answer is obvious, but hopefully this will generate a, a little bit of a conversation, does that imperil this idea of American civil religion? I mean, I can start and just say, you know, because I think others are going to have more to say about this than me, than me, but I'll just say, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, and I think you can, in a way, see both possibilities at, um, at could see both of these possibilities at, at, at the inauguration. So, you know, when, on the one hand, Biden's uh, rhetoric, which was uh, by some measures really the, the most religious inaugural address, the most theological inaugural address, at least since Eisenhower, you know, with, for example, the explicit invocation of Augustine, poetry from Seamus Heaney, the, in his favorite Catholic poet, um, that just falls flat with a lot of young Americans. I mean, I know this from my own experience, and I suspect that everybody else on the panel can probably confirm that, and Nicole also alluded to uh, you know, the, the the fact that, you know, this kind of third civil rights movement that we're seeing now in the form of Black Lives Matter, I mean, many of the activists, you know, are more, you know, with Ta Ta-Nehisi Coates than they are with Benjamin Barber, right? I mean, they are, they see themselves in explicitly and self-consciously secular and even in even atheistic terms. But then there's, and then I'm going to kind of punt this one off uh, to Nicole, because I know she's thought about this, but then there's um, Amanda Gorman's, uh, what are you going to call it, you know, 
slam poetry performance. That's probably I'm getting the genres wrong, but where she was able in some ways to kind of take some of these themes of the prophetic blacks of a religion mm -hmm. and express them in a kind of more lyrical and poetic way that was not explicitly theological, but I think still uh, struck some of those mystic chords of memory that, uh, that, that many Americans share. Nicole, why don't you pick up on that? Sure. So uh, as I was thinking about it, um, I wasn't necessarily thinking about Amanda Gorman, but um, but I can I can segue into Amanda Gorman. Um, while there is a decrease in um, uh, religious affiliation, uh, I th I think there is a tension here when it comes to uh, America's uh, civil religious understandings of itself because we still have on our coinage in God we trust. What, what are we gonna do with that? Um, we still have a pledge of allegiance, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Now, there might be some, um, um, uh, I, I loved, and, and I think that this is where uh, Bella was trying to tackle this, um, um, with liberty and justice for all, uh, points to broken covenants, mm -hmm. right? Um, but in, in our sacred documents, um, our Bill of Rights, our constitution on, uh, and, and as well as on our coinage, on our bills, um, uh, our pledge of allegiance, our national anthems, um, there is still a reference, still civil religious references. Uh, so I don't know how to square the decrease in religious affiliation with um, uh, implying that um, America's civil religious traditions uh, or, or, or tradition might be dying or dead. Um, um, and even Bella himself uh, struck, uh, I don't want to say struggled because struggle would mean that he struggled, but 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 wanted to name civil religion something different as he matured in his thinking. Yet I don't know what what other what what would be the other name. Um, so the nation's um, beginnings and developments uh, is strongly tied to this civil religious tradition. So when we think about Amanda Gorman and politics um, today, uh, everyone is asking, what are we going to do with the polarization that is happening in America? And um, from my perspective, we needed an inauguration. We needed an inauguration to counterbalance um, the 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 uh, strong display. Now, everybody on January six was not a Christian nationalist, mm -hmm. um, but the strong display of Christian nationalism that um, uh, uh, and 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 Phil can talk to this better than I can. <laughs> And and Whitehead and Perry can talk to this better than I can, but but this rate this this religiously authoritative um, yet tribal and racialized form of Christianity that points to um, uh, division, um, at least with American civil religion, there is strivings towards inclusion even if, and hence more perfect union, right? Even if there are, um, even if the strivings have to overcome uh, uh, broken covenants, but, and so what Amanda Gorman does, and, 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 and I would say reflect both, both President Biden and Gorman reflected in their uh, deliveries at the inauguration, not consensus, 
And I think that that's what we have to push against. I mean, Charles Long mm-hmm. talked about this in the 1970s, yeah. uh, that civil religion isn't should not necessarily be about consensus, but we heard with, with what they offered the nation, um, there's this recognition that civil religion is superstructural and infrastructural. It is above the nation and it is part of the nation. It um, reinforces nationhood and peoplehood and it um, recognizes um, that there are failures to striving towards uh, nationhood. And, 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 and so one of the reasons why I say it was important um, is we needed, we needed a civil religion to bring us back together and to unify us under this canopy, despite our different stories. And we saw and we heard different stories. We saw this young woman who's 22 years old, a Harvard graduate, yet comes from a single, um, uh, a, 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 a single mother black single mother family and has a twin uh, and has been, and many have poured into her and, and, um, and, and, and delivered a civil religious, uh, a civil religious inaugural uh, poem. Uh, And, and, but, but, but then we also have a President Biden who also delivered a civil religious speech, but, but they both represented uh, the diversity that I think a civil religion can contain or the diversity of stories um, because Biden's stories is compelling. Service to the nation, son who is who dies of cancer. I mean, it might sound like spectacle, but a good story is one that um, people can connect to and relate to. So as a black woman, I, related to him. I connected to him because his story isn't one of just triumph. His story is one of failings. I mean, how many times did he run for president or aspire? And now at what, 78? <laughs> he finally, he's finally president. So I say all that to say the importance of civil religion uh, in today's political arena is because of the polarization that people are trying to um, treat, overcome, or point out and recognize. And the question is, how is it going to be overcome? And uh, a civil religion that is that strives towards inclusiveness um, uh, becomes a guide towards nationhood and peoplehood, despite the failures and the failings. Thanks, Nicole. You you brought us right into, and I appreciate that. Uh, What can, let's talk about what American civil religion can do for us today. We saw it on display. We've talked about its history. Uh, Let's talk about that a little bit. Lisa, why don't you pick up and and say, tell us what you think it can do for us today, and then we'll move to John. Yeah, I think for for us today, it can help open dialogue and discussion um, about our past histories and those failings uh, that we've pointed out and the recognition of harm, specific harms that have been done to particular peoples. Um, And then it can lead to, I hope, some more productive conversation to repair some of those breaches, in the words of William Barber, right? Uh, and then to be able to to sort of move forward. I mean, the, the, Nicole, you talked about this distinction between the spectacle and the story, and I couldn't help when watching, you know, I hear the mention of indigenous peoples in the benediction, right, uh, delivered there by uh, Reverend Beeman. Um, but and then I saw, you know, later in the evening, the uh, uh, Denny Medicine Bird, the Kiowa Cheyenne Arapaho, right, dancing behind Demi Lovato's performance there. And that spectacle and the inclusion there of Indigenous people. And yet I hear JLo talking, this land is your land, this land is my land, right? So the progressive liberal Woody Guthrie, right, coming in. And for indigenous folks, well, whose land was it before (laughs) the the settler colonials arrived, right? 
And then you, you again, so the story and the spectacle, and then you just kind of have it all culminated in Garth Brooks. And I love Garth Brooks. He lives up the road here in Owasso from me, tipping his, you know, inaugural Stetson uh, with amazing grace. So the idea of the conquest of the American West by the Cowboys blessed now by religion. And so I think these kind of symbols and the discussion that we can have around the rituals and the symbols and what they mean can then help us better understand where we have failed and where civil religion can then the you know try to unite us uh, in going forward. Thanks, uh, Lisa. John? I think if we're going to talk about what, uh, what the promise or potential of civil religion is today, one thing to think about is, um, uh, is in some ways what a different moment we're in right now. Uh, I wrote after the inauguration of, of Donald Trump and the address that he gave that that was the starkest departure of anything we have ever seen in any inaugural address ever before. Nothing, nothing comes close to that. And that set uh, a marker. It was an announcement. It was a, it was a shot across the bra- the bow for what's coming next and what would become, what would come after that. I think it's in the moment we're in now, still in some cases reeling from the insurrection, still reeling from still facing, um, utter falsehoods about about voter fraud, efforts to to crack down and disenfranchise people. Uh, we really have to step back and think about well, what maybe we took for granted in some cases what civil religion has done for us for quite some time. So, uh, at the risk of sounding trite, civil religion has always been a very bipartisan uh, language. If you read the inaugural addresses of presidents from both parties, uh, dripping in language of freedom, of liberty, of justice, of democracy, of extolling the past, referencing uh, historical events, monuments, looking out, you know, inauguration, inaugural address is given there right in front of the Capitol, looking out with all of the monuments shaped in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in, a, in the shape of a cross, of course, um, you know, all of these things that Americans are supposed to just simply agree upon. We can take these things for granted. We all know what we disagree upon, and we've had massive policy kinds of debates and differences in recent years. Um, but those, to me, as I, when I think about what have been the most arduous, uh, arduous debates and difficult debates, they, they almost kind of just recede into the distance right now. We're not, I mean, the, the abortion is an extremely difficult policy issue. It's just very, very hard. But the major differences right now in our political divide are not, in my view, primarily over abortion or other so-called culture war issues. So civil religion is reminding us of, in the rift that we see, to some extent, is reminding us of what we've what we've lost and where it is we can preserve a kind of fundamental sense of a ground that we share and can stand upon, whatever our differences about certain policies, laws. Uh, and and things might be. So I think that's really important. The second thing is uh, another, I would make a pitch for the idea of consensus. A consensus when it's backed up by force can be uh, a form of violence. We know that. That is definitely true. We always have to keep that in mind. However, there is a consensus about um, uh, that we accept today that we about racial equality, about fundamental rights that we did not accept 50 years ago. It's not a fully realized consensus. We need to do more. We need to do better. But we need to be aspiring to actually that kind of moral consensus that the language of civil religion can provide. And I think that the language, say, of religious nationalism does not aspire to provide. So we need to have more consensus about uh, the treatment of black people by police. And we're actually moving there. I, there has been important movement. We want that kind of consensus. We want to encourage that and cultivate that in the language of civil religion, whether it's explicitly religious or kind of more symbolic, uh, as, as Nicole was talking about in the in the work of you know, or the um, the gestures of Colin Kaepernick. 
we want that kind of consensus. So I think we have to we have to embrace it. We just need to understand that it's got to be an inclusive understanding of consensus. It's not white male uh, consensus. Thanks, John. I want to give each of you one, uh, two minutes max to give sort of a closing statement. And I'd like I'd like to to include in that what you think the hope is for us in American civil religion and where there's perhaps a danger. And maybe danger is too strong of a word, but where's the hope and where are the challenges in seeing a, a American civil religion in its role for the United States? Uh, let's begin with Lisa and then uh, just move through the group. Yeah, I think in terms of the hope that it can provide, a, as as John and Phil have suggested, and Nicole as well, a foundational sort of way that we can build upon for a much more inclusive country in terms of uh, rights and recognitions uh, and equality and those sort of cherished values and ideals. I think the challenges are to continue to respect some of the particularities of peoples that are involved and what they might, how they might then interpret, uh, you know, um, and, and I really like, I think, kind of what Nicole was talking about, different, different forms of civil religion and a respect for those, but yet even in that particularity, there is some universality of values, I think, that can transcend, that we can live into um, and work towards as a country. Nicole, thanks, Lisa. Um, I would say um, the hope of a, a civil religion, and, and I agree with John in terms of the consensus, I think I would say it uh, in, in a different way. I would say it that way, but I would also say um, consensus comes in this civic and uh, covenantal responsibility to work together. Um, and so going back to John Winthrop's language, right, and, and, and concept um, um, in the model of Christian uh, charity. So um, that's, the, that's, that's the hope of civil religion. I think another hope... Um, which also brings up um, a, a, a problem or a challenge to civil religion is that um, um, civil religion emerges during times of crisis, during times of trial. So the civil war, um, uh, civil rights, um, 9-11, um, all these, these particular moments in time that um, and, and, and it is distinct from, but connected to American exceptionalism. Um, and so it, 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 it causes us to pause uh, and, to, and to consider um, this question, who is American and what it means to be American. So Americanness, which is what uh, Lisa mm -hmm. uh, talked about, mm -hmm. um, which then brings up the, the, the problem of who is American. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And what it means to be American, and the reality is, um, civil religion, and 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 I would say Bella says civil religion is not enough. Um, um, civil, and and so it has to be counterbalanced by a public theology. So where it falls mm -hmm. short, public theology, these um, national communities, religious communities, but not church, um, articulate that which is just and righteous and moral and ethical. Thanks, Nicole. John? One of the things that I would say that should give us some kind of hope, and it's a, it's a kind of faith commitment to say this, is that the American project experiment claims to be universal. Now that can lead to all sorts of problems. I think we understand pretty well what those problems have, have been historically and can be. Um, but that also means that, as we say in our, in, a, in our own kind of American creed, anyone can come here and by embracing certain principles, regardless of your nationality, your background, or any, uh, your, um, uh, your, your own particular faith tradition, that uh, you can be fully American. 
this is the problem. Do we, do we really believe that? We have to show that we believe that. Uh, and that's the ongoing work that we need to do. We need vocabularies to remind us of what those beliefs are, and civil religion affords us such a kind of vocabulary, a kind of, um, that's why I call the inaugur inaugural address as a kind of a catechism. It's a reminder of who we are and what it is that we believe and what we're called to live up to. And so we have to be willing and able to try to make those arguments and have those conversations using a variety of different means to do so. So if you're an atheist, appealing to God and providence and to the, uh, and to the creator is not the way to try to uh, demonstrate what the, the, the truth or the, the belief in the American uh, project is. It's being able to show that one can be fully uh, American and part, of the, uh, and part of the country and the nation uh, by being an atheist. And we've got to be able to make those kinds of um, have those kind of conversations on a lot of different in a lot of different ways and a lot of different grounds and terms. Thanks, John. Phil. Sure. So let me put our current situation in the sharpest possible terms. I think that the United States is at a hard fork in the road between um, a multiracial democracy on the one hand and some form of white supremacist restoration of authoritarianism on the other. So what role can civil religion possibly play in this moment? Um, to some conservative white Christians who are tempted by the idolatry of white Christian nationalism, it provides an alternative way, um, a different political theology that will help them think about the relationship between their Christianity and patriotism in a more inclusive um, and democratic fashion. For secular progressives, I think that it can remind them of the positive role that uh, prophetic forms of Christianity and religiously driven social movements um, have played in um, progress towards the things that they value most, such as racial equality and and social justice. And I think lastly, that it can remind everybody that in this current moment, there's a lot more at stake than your uh, personal short-term policy preferences by placing this moment um, in a much deeper historical and even transcendent framework. Thank you, Phil. We could definitely do a second or third hour, but uh, we're in 2021, and an hour's about max of attention spans, <laughs> yours and mine probably as well. Uh, we have been listening to Dr. Nicole R. Phillips, Director of the Black Church Studies Program at Emory University, Dr. Philip Gorski, Professor of Sociology at Yale University, Dr. John Carlson, Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Arizona State University, and Dr. Lisa Barnett, Assistant Professor of American Religious History at Phillips Theological Seminary discuss the history and ramifications of American civil religion and how understanding this helps us better participate in the American experiment today and to see for it, to its successful future for us and our children. The Startup Digital First National Museum of American Religion is both a place of convening for discussions about current national issues where religion or the idea of religious freedom is in play, as we are doing today or as we did today, and the nationally recognized center for presenting, interpreting, and educating the public about what religion has done to America and what America has done to religion, including the history of the revolutionary and indispensable idea of religious freedom as a governing principle in the United States. Join us in supporting the National Museum of American Religion by donating at storyofamericanreligion.org forward slash contribute, where for a donation of $200 or more, you will receive a free gift. Nicole, Philip, John, and Lisa, thank you so very much for being with us today. It has been enlightening and helpful in our quest to understand what religion has done to America including the establishment of religious freedom and how we can best participate in the public square today. The podcast series, Religion in the American Experience, is a project of the National Museum of American Religion. 
Episodes are released each Monday on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Register for notifications on our website, www.storyofamericanreligion.org, under the sign-up tab. <laughs>